We're going to allow folks to trickle on in and then we will get started. In the meantime, we just get to uh, admire your books, Ricardo. I know we didn't get a chance to, to chat about what's up there, but I always love to see people's books. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for doing this, Andrea. I appreciate oh it. My God. Are you kidding? This is such an honor. I'm thrilled. I, I was in Chile when it came out, so I missed all of this. The cherry gross. I'm still, I can't wait to listen to it. Well, that's a, it's, I, sounds awesome being in Chile. It must yeah. have been great. It was. Um, yeah, this is always the awkward part. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to hold up your book? Me like this? Uh, yes. Yeah, you kind the of- The whole time I talk about you, you need to hold it up. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. I'm gonna be holding it too. This book is a book that everyone should read. And I'm gonna say that. All right, I think I can start on my end and this way we can allow folks to get more of y'all. So good evening. And welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Kay from Greenlight, and we are thrilled to host tonight's event with Ricardo Nuila presenting his new book, The People's Hospital, Hope and Peril in American Medicine. Yep, there it is. Look at that beautiful cover. Yeah, he will be talking with Andrea Elliott, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Ricardo to Andrea and to the team at Scribner for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. We are grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways that you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the authors and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by either panelist, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The People's Hospital, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. I hope every time we say the title, even in conversation, it's just, there it is. <laughs> it's available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore, and it came out a week ago, so please buy it. As thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we are offering 10% off the featured book. Enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off, and I will put that in the chat as well. Our interviewer tonight is Andrea Elliott. Andrea Elliott is an investigative reporter for the New York Times and the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Invisible Child. It hosted her for her book too. <laughs> her reporting has been awarded two Pulitzer Prizes among many, many additional honors. Elliot is the first woman to win individual Pulitzer Prizes in both journalism and arts and letters. She will be speaking, heck yeah, she will be speaking with our featured author, Ricardo Nuilla. Dr. Ricardo Nuilla is a writer, teacher, and practicing doctor. He is an associate professor of medicine, medical ethics, and health policy at Bayer, Baylor College of Medicine, where he directs the human Humanities, Expression and Arts Lab, or the HEAL program. Where does one go without health insurance when turned away by hospitals, clinics, and doctors? In the People's Hospital, physician Ricardo Nuilla's stunning debut, we follow the lives of five uninsured Houstonians as their struggle for survival leads them to a hospital where insurance comes second to genuine care. Ricardo is going to start us off with a reading from the book, then he'll be talking with Andrea, and then with all of you. So please take it away, Ricardo. 
Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here with you, Andrea. And I'm going to start off by reading from the very beginning of the People's Hospital from Chapter 1, Histories. The rumor we heard was that patients arrived with hand-drawn maps, our hospital marked like treasure. The stately Nigerian lady who responded, yes, doctor, to everything, metastatic breast cancer. The boy with the black curly hair wearing red Converse All-Stars and a Judas Priest t-shirt that screamed Mexico City, acute lymphocytic le leukemia. The grandmother with the sari snagged in the guardrails, chest pain, real chest pain, might need bypass. We stood at these patients' bedsides. We wrote down their histories. We said we were sorry for examining them with cold hands. We ordered blood tests, interpreted EKGs, scrolled through their CAT scans. We input diagnoses. We weren't just doctors. Among us were nurses, social workers, x-ray techs, the people who rode up and down the hallways in the middle of the night waxing the floors. Some of us wore white coats with frayed sleeves and busted pockets. Others tight-fitting scrubs embroidered with our names. In our bad moments, we became tribal. We weren't we. We were ortho, medicine, plastics, the 4A nurses. We only covered the unit. More often, though, the needs of our patients were so damn immediate, we found a way to work as one. We ran blood transfusions, heparin drips, a morphine pump when Norco didn't touch the pain. When COVID came, we gave oxygen together, one of us twisting the knob on the valve while the other inserted those tiny prongs into, into flared nostrils. We consulted one another when things looked dicey, surgery if we found boils, ID for antibiotics, and if anything looked remotely like a seizure, a twitch, a rolling of the eyes, we paged neurology overhead. If transportation was swamped, we wheeled them ourselves to MRI, to special procedures, to the cath lab, even the ICU, how downtrodden we looked when we did this, like beaten dogs. We figured out ways to make things work. Not enough money for your meds? We Googled the $4 list at Walmart. Muscles too weak? We dug up a refurbished walker from the basement. Dying and homeless and alone? We called in a favor from the hospice that used to be a tutor style home. And when our work was done, once we could envision someone not dying within 24 hours of our discharge order, once the first chemo had gone in, once we could be sure their chief complaint was addressed, the thought still lingered in our minds. What brought them here? What are their stories? That's wow. from the first chapter of, uh, that's the very beginning of the People's Hospital, first chapter. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Ricardo. I want to start by acknowledging that I am not just here as a huge admirer of this book, which is a book that everyone must read. Um, I was around long before Terry Gross put it on Fresh Air last week and New York Times raved it in its most recent, uh, one of the book's recent book reviews. Uh, the reception's been incredible, but well before that, I was in a room with a number of other writers up at the um, Logan Nonfiction Residency, and I got to hear you read that opening passage. And I want to just remember that when you finished reading it, there was this sort of like collective jaw drop. Mm. Uh, it's so stunning. And I think one of the things that is of many things about you that's so admirable, the thing that I think is actually other, it goes beyond admirable into the realm of remarkable is that you write like that's the only thing you do. Mm. <laughs> you are truly a writer with a capital W and you also happen to have this huge other existence as a doctor. And so I just want to bow down to you uh, first, just to oh. acknowledge that and to be so, so excited about this book. I think the first thing I want you to talk to us about tonight, Ricardo, is the origin story of this book. Um, what made you want to write this book? When did this idea get planted as a seed or how? Yeah, I mean, I it started it's hard to start to think about exactly when it started, but I know that it started with patients when I was working in the hospital and just this thought that a lot of us doctors had that, you know, we, somebody needs to write about this. And I was a very fresh and young uh, resident at the time 
thinking to myself, and I really wanted to be a writer. Um, I really was thinking I'm only going to be in medicine for a little bit. And then I want to write. And it, this story was like kind of like bubbling underneath my feet. I didn't really realize it. But the more and more I got to know the people, the my patients, what they went through, the more and more I asked myself, do people know about this? Do people know about these people's lives? And also just to see the drama that they went through and how that helped my own writing. I, I, it, it, it came, there came a point where I was like, I would like to depict this. And it started off like that. It did not start off as a grand, you know, uh, you know, book about healthcare. It was more like, I just want to write patient stories. And right. over time, it developed more into the, that connective tissue on, whoa, what is this going to say about where we're at in healthcare? So it started off as patient stories. Right. And th speaking of those patients, talk a little bit about how you chose which ones to write about and what was involved in that and how they responded or how do they feel about it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, I think that... And I think part of it, is, I mean, you you remember what it was like to, to feel the magic drawn to certain people like Dasani when you were drawn to Dasani. I remember you talking to me about that in Logan. And I feel similar to some of the, the people's stories, their, just their aura, you know, how much they would want to share. It, it, it was part of that was just like I could see their stories written on the page. You know, there's these twists and turns all of the things that they have to do in order to seek healthcare. There's this natural quest that America has made in so many people's lives that in order to get healthcare, you have to go, jump through so many hoops. And when people are telling you about that at their bedside, it starts to kind of almost lay down on the page. You, you can see it laid down on the page, how this would be something you could write about. And then there was also one of the, one of the points that, you know, one thing that came to mind was like, again, that question, like, what does the public not know about? And I think that the hospital where I work at, Bentob Hospital in Houston, one of the preconceptions that people in America had was that, oh, that's for, that's for homeless people and that's for poor people. And that's really, that is what, who affects health, you know, people who don't have insurance or those kind of people. And that's not what I was dealing with on a daily basis. And I wanted to demonstrate that that preconception that people have is not correct. And so there was, for instance, one of the first subjects, one of the first people is uh, Stephen, and he is a restaurant manager who, own, who makes $75,000 a year. And he just elects for his lowest plan, uh, insurance plan, which is not enough to cover his cancer diagnosis. And he really abhors the idea that he's going to the public hospital. So I want, you know, his story, he was so vocal. He was so appreciative too of like the healthcare that he received. He also seemed to be, you know, that symbol of, you know, what these preconceptions. So it was a little bit of, uh, of, of putting all of those things together. Right. Has there been any response among the patients to the book? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm meeting with Stephen actually on Friday to give him a book. I was trying to do this before, but it, every, you know, everything kind of like has, has, has gone like an avalanche, but we, we, we've been in email contact and it's, it's a pleasure to be able to give him the book because he entrusted me with his story, but he also, you know, I think one of the interesting, and, and that's something that I think that you uh, dealt with too, is that it's. I don't use pseudonyms, you know, like there's a lot of nonfiction writing, like there's, there's pseudonym use to protect people, but th the people in this book wanted their stories. They wanted their names attached to their stories. And Stephen was one of them. And, um, uh, you know, I think his response has been like, you know, he, through the fact checking and everything, he's just been happy that this stories can be helpful. And that's really one of the key parts about this is that, Everybody who has wanted their story to be in this book, like they wanted it to help somebody else out. They wanted America or some other person to learn from what has happened to them. And that's just been really one of the most more inspirational things that I've, uh, that I've come across in writing this book. And let's talk about that. What is it that America stands to learn from this book? 
um, maybe we could begin by just talking about what public health care is and where it exists yeah. uh, besides your hospital. What is your hospital really uh, force a reckoning with? Yeah, I, I think that that's a, you know, I, that's been on my mind. That was, uh, it took me a while to even figure that out. I had to work there for a, a long time before I realized, wait a second, how are people getting healthcare if they can't afford it? Oh, wait a second. This is funded by property. This is a city-based or county-based healthcare system, safety net healthcare system where property taxes funds the healthcare for people who cannot afford it. And in my time there, I've also seen that what it means to not be able to afford it change according to so many different things. First of all, the job market. You know, the, once the job market waivers, we see a lot of people in the hospital because by, by in the American system, pegging health insurance to work, it depends on the job market. So if, if people are laid off, you know, they lose their health insurance and they lose their chance at healing from their, from the, their illness. Um, it's, it's what Ben Taub hospital is, is the flagship hospital for the safety net healthcare system, the public healthcare system that is funded by property taxes of the county. It exists in other parts of Texas, for instance, El Paso, Dallas, San Antonio have working county-based systems, but it is a bit particular to this region because in other places, state governments take up a lot, give a lot of money to the health care of that. But they have their own gaps. But in Houston, with, because the state has yielded so much control to localities and counties, that's why a, a health care system like this has developed in Houston, Texas. Well, you recently had, you know, were interviewed by Terry Gross, and um, she expressed some surprise about healthcare. That you know, that that uh, with respect to your book, can you uh, summarize what her surprise was, and if you can counter that elsewhere? Well, I think one of her surprises was that uh, me, as a doctor, one of the reasons I like to work where I work, which is a safety net hospital is because I can dedicate time to my patients. I'm not under the thumb of the under the thumb of corporations to make me make more money. Now, American healthcare, I go through a lot of the history in this book and in in the current organization of healthcare, which is that a lot of corporations have vertically integrated healthcare so that corporations own the insurance companies, the hospitals, the doctors uh, groups and so a lot of it is mechanized so that the extra test that you order brings about more profit, right? And so you will find very, you know, often colleagues of my, meaning people who work the same job that I do, hospitalists, uh, which means that they are doc internal medicine doctors that are responsible for people who are hospitalized that they will see, you know, in one night, 24 patients, admit 24 patients. I have a cap of 15 patients a day. And the re and Terry Gross was very impressed by that, it sounded like to me, that, you know, that there is a, you know, for, for quality, for safety reasons, at a place where you would think it would be bustling with people and that we, we have too little to work with, it's actually we make time for the doctors to be with patients. And why is that important? Just to ask you a very obvious question, but yeah. I never find that your answers are obvious. They're always they're always revelatory. Why does it matter? What what's the difference between the, the a doctor who has to um, go through twenty six patients and the one who is capped at fifteen? What 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 difference does that make for the patient? I think it's the difference between thinking and conversing with a patient and just hitting a button and ordering another test is really what it kind of boils down to in my mind. Like when I genuinely like sitting with my patients, listening to them, thinking about their stories and trying to avoid extra cost. And I'm empowered to do so in my public healthcare system. Whereas I think that if you are, so, and I, I know what it's like when, when I'm at that cap of 15, it is, it is, it's like the time that I can dedicate to each of those patients is less, right? Because there's, there's just so much work that needs to be done that you automatically will allocate that time less because that's just the scarcity of time. So I think that the cap is so imp important because of that, because it 
allows me to organize my day so that I can say, I need to, I need to have this conversation with this person right now, or I can be like, this person is really doing quite well. And, you know, we, we've had this conversation the last two days, I can take my time and give it to somebody else. But that, that planning and that time and that connection with people, I think is something that the American healthcare system overlooks in favor of tests often. Tests and diagnoses, rather than allowing for time to understand something you've written so powerfully about, which is narrative, the patient's yeah. narrative, um, which can sound to the outside observer like something that is more about principles or values rather than actually useful in terms of medicine. But I think you would make the case that it is useful when it comes to actually doing, practicing oh. good medicine. I think it's very, that's one of the lessons that writing has given me. Like I said, I, I, I have this strange origin story for being a, uh, like, I, I, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a doctor for years. I wanted, I was desperately wanting to be a writer, but I didn't have the bravery really to step away and, and, and join that. You know, I was like, I'm just being in med, but one of the lessons that I learned from writing is, is that when you are tr really trying to depict somebody's motives their thoughts you you really empathize with them and i think that you by empathizing with them you can tap into that narrative arc that they have you can tap you you can also get a sense of their decisions you know i feel like one of the things in medicine that that is very helpful is just to be able to sit down and and like kind of draw out what do you want you know what is it that you you know want from your health care what are your goals not, and not and, and to challenge my own presumptions or the medical field's presumptions of what your goals might be, because those conversations tell me so much about what that person wants and who that person is. And I think a lot of that comes from like this training that I've given myself of narrative and of like from literature. Oh, that's so interesting. Well, let's talk about the craft um, and how you balance writing with practicing medicine uh I mean first of all just let's go there how, how do you do that how do you well, pull that up? well you know I think it balance is a, <laughs> yeah I, I think if you if you ask me at different parts of my life I'd be like it's no there's no balance at all you know mm -hmm. but it's uh but what I would say today I really believe this is is that I see this as one thing now today medicine and writing to me are like one thing which is that I I literally feel like when I'm writing I feel like I'm working on being a better doctor. And when I am practicing medicine, I feel like I'm working on my writing skills because each of those have enough overlap where, and I've, and I, and I feel like I've had like enough sort of study and introduction to each of the fields where I can see like the overlap in, you know, in the Venn diagram, if you will. So uh, the balance is really just time and, you know, each of them, even though like that sounds really nice, but you do have to dedicate time to the craft to each of them. And um, I think early in my career, I had to, I had to really dedicate time to writing. And so I, I remember very clearly as a resident starting off internal medicine residency, I was like, I'm either going to write or I'm not going to write. And it, it's going to take time. So I started waking up at 4.30 in the morning before going in as a resident and uh, writing two hours before I went into the hospital. And I I think I don't do that. Now. I don't wake up at 4.30 anymore right now, unless my kids wake me up. But it's, <laughs> uh, but but I think I needed that time. I did not know that I was also processing. I did, It wasn't my intention to like, oh, I'm taking what I have seen on the wards and all the drama and all of all of the people, you know, like what they tell me, I'm processing that. To me, it was just about right, but I was doing that, you know, it wasn't my intention to do that, but I was. But um, finding time to learn the craft is very important uh, also, but they have become one for me now. And um, as we continue our conversation, I want to invite anyone who has questions to post them in our Q and A? Um, I want to ask you a little bit about healthcare worker burnout, which is something mm -hmm. that has been increasingly discussed uh, in uh, since COVID hit. And I am also just wondering, like, do you feel burnout? How do you yeah, care about it for yourself? I mean that's a really good question. I feel like um, sometimes I, uh, you know, burnout's a it's a really tough term to define. And I think that people de define it differently. 
Um, I've seen people burned out, uh, including people very close to me. And that's part of the book, I would say. Uh, I think that I would not care, categorize myself in that. Do I feel sometimes where I'm just like, I don't know if I can do that anymore? It can happen, but I do feel that the that's where meaning helps so much. Meaning like that if you can derive like a narrative that makes sense of all this, it can absorb a lot of that. And that's where I feel like for my call, some, I get emails from certain people, from colleagues who said, I'm a doctor. I, you know, they work in, 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 in the Texas medical center, they're doing good work, but they say, I don't see any meaning in my work. And it really breaks my heart because I feel like in medicine, it's so easy to uh, to do something good for somebody on a daily basis and to and to find that level of satisfaction where somebody thanks you. Like, for instance, it's like it it really is one of those things where I enjoy doing giving people like ice water. You know, it's just like I will ask, are you good with ice water? I can get you more ice water. And I, it's just like people will say thank you. And it just feel and, and I'm just like, that's a good thing. Right. And it's it's also, there's two words that my Spanish speaking patients uh, say that I can feel like, okay, I've achieved meaning for today. And that's like, they will say muy amable. You know, when, when I have given the, the plan and I've been with them enough and, and, and I explain things and they're like, no, muy amable, you know, doctor, I, I'm just like. Great, it's such a great phrase in Spanish because it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's so commonly used, you forget the muy amable means how lovable. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's, I don't know if it's, it, there's a, a real English equivalent, you know, because the lovableness of it is like, it's not the same as kindness. It's a, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a little bit more kind of like emotional and heartrending, you know? So uh, I, I really, you know, I, I literally take, take a lot of, you know, from that, from the, from those interactions, I work on a salary which means that I don't make bonuses. So it's not like I am compelled to move on from that moment, you know, be, in order to kind of like bring my, bring my income up higher, you know? And I think that that's one of the fundamental issues with our American healthcare system where we have to reckon with that, that that is like, I mean, none other than President Nixon called it the illogical incentive of our healthcare system, which is the more you do, the more sickness that you show, the more that you will find, uh, the more it incentivizes doctors to make money. You know, they make money with the more tests that they do. And so it's, it's like, that's really one of the reasons why I feel like muy amable moments are more accessible to me, just because it's like, I mean, it's, it's not, it doesn't boil down in my mind to like, I have another $250 if I, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, that right. can, that happens at an unconscious level. I think, I don't think that healthcare workers are like, but I think it, it's, it, you have, we have to admit that that is operative to some extent. Absolutely. We have a question from someone who's listening in. Uh, he writes, um, this is a bit of a random question from the early part of the book, but mm -hmm. how did you learn about Anton Chekhov and his history? And to that point, what resources or books would you recommend that one can read about him? Yeah, I so I, I, I learned about Chekhov from learning to write, really. I mean, I in my desires to write, to, to become a writer, I think I came upon Chekhov through the work of George Saunders, really. And it, I think it's one of those things where it, like people who are creative writers and are short story writers, they will, you know, cause I started off as a short story writer in fiction and it was just like, you, you get to check off pretty quickly. Cause he's, he's masterful. Uh, he's the master, he's the master of the short story. What I loved about Chekhov was that I found out that he was a writer, not because of his stories. Cause he writes about people. I found out about it like in Wikipedia, you know, oh, he's a, he's a doctor, you know, like, and you don't see the medicine in his short stories. You, you can look for it and you'll find it. But I think that his letters, the letters of Anton Chekhov are some, are, is remarkable. I, I can just sit there, flip through it. And I love it because he's writing from a time where like science is being discovered. He has this, he has this incredible enthusiasm. He would be a guy who would get a million muy amables every day, you know, because that's just the kind of guy that Chekhov comes off as. He's so effusive 
and but he's he's energetic about it and he wants to do good for humanity but he also happens to be able to sit down and write masterpieces so that's one of the first places i'd also just get the the, his book the collected book of short stories and just read them you know so who else inspires you as a writer well i love the prose of dennis johnson for dennis johnson's a big like i just you know the largesse of the sea maiden is something that i read a lot uh, you know every year uh i i have you know edwidge danicat i have so many different Rachel Cusk for her prose and the way that she describes things. Uh, I think in the nonfiction world, it's been, you know, so many, it's, uh, you know, um, random family was a big uh, book for me. Uh, the gonzo journalists, Tom Wolf, they were all really inspirational how they, you know, made it an art. The, the nonfiction became like a real artful, you, you, you started to see the the prose become art right there. But I was mostly drawn to fiction, mostly like my roots are really in literature, are really through fiction. How much writing do you do on average every week? And I just want to go back to the craft for a moment. Can you talk about your process? Um, yeah, that's a really good question because I think it's so variable. It depends on those waves. I'm just- Of course. I- <laughs> I remember at Logan, you, 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 I learned a lot from you as being very organized. And I realized that I'm a very disorganized person and I need to become more organized. I learned, I learned some good, good, good things from you, but I, I, it really, I, I just go with, you know, I, I will write something like maybe 500 words in a day if I'm like really on and I feel, and those are good 500 words that'll propel me for like tour, like you, you feel like you're getting toward the next draft. Sometimes I'll write more than that, like very occasionally, like a thousand, a thousand two hundred, but not much more, you know? I think that it's, um, it's it, I happen to not be able to just relax. I can't relax until the prose is just right, until I get the real sound of it right. And that takes me a long, long time. So I'm a, I'm a pretty slow writer, I would say. Do you read your work to yourself out loud? I have, yeah, I do. Not not at the beginning stages, but toward the end, it was invaluable doing that. Um, especially coming toward the end of this book, of writing this book, it was very important to read it out loud, to hear it, and. You know, I think some of it was like, because I, I am so much focused on like how it sounds at the beginning that like it wasn't, but but it will show you some differences that you weren't like tuned to, you know? So you started this book in 2017. Can you talk about anything that happened in a major way that changed the book? Of course, there's the pandemic. Um, yeah. How did that change the course of the book? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, that... It, I had like patient stories and I had, you know, a working structure that right when the pandemic happened, you know, everybody's focus was on the pandemic. And I just knew that you couldn't write a book about healthcare without at least shedding light on the pandemic or at least talking about the pandemic. So, but I think what happened in the pandemic is also that it helped me delve deeper into some of the questions that I had about the safety net hospital. You know, it kind of, it was, it was actually something that I feel my book needed a little bit of a test, you know, to, um, to, de to, to go into those questions about what public health care is to think about like structuring it um, and to make it so that the, I I had a I had a sense that people coming off the pandemic that we, the the whole m much larger audience would want to know about healthcare because everybody has been going through the pandemic in one way or the other you know so it it made me think more about broadening like the book for the audience as well. Talk a little bit about um, what you think the public stands to learn from the story of this hospital? What is it that, that Americans are missing that your book might help them see? I think 
what Americans are missing is a that healthcare costs are central to one of the reasons why people can't get access. That also be that there are many many examples of waste and overconsumption of healthcare, and that that has a direct effect on people being unable to access healthcare. But C, more importantly, that we have a preconception in America that these things have to be done through the market and through private uh, endeavors, right? That the assumption in America is, is that we're all just, uh, we all, if we let the market take care of it, it it'll be just fine. The assumption is that um, these, that, you know, that public health care, that nothing public is as good as private corporations doing that. And what I feel like is that in my reading research, and I feel like in everybody's experience right now, I mean, I would ask anybody, what do you feel about healthcare? How do you feel about your healthcare experience? And I think that if you are like me, which is that I str- I even like think of it as like a moral quandary when my child is yelling in the middle of the night, I'm like, I don't know if he's in an emergency or not, but I don't want to go to the hospital because I don't like the experience of like feeling like that the uh, that I'm going to be accosted by bills that are arbitrary and made up and that it's going to affect the way that that health care is given to me. Well, then I think that what that is the presumption that we have. Well, we are living in a very privatized healthcare system. It's pretty extreme, actually, compared to the rest of the world. And I think that that is something that I wanted to to highlight, that if we question these presumptions, these preconceptions, if we there's precedent for that, and and maybe we can take a step forward altogether and make in in forging a healthcare system that we all want. Well, how did it come to be so privatized? Yeah, I think that part of it was just like that's just kind of the the the, uh, the fallback. I mean, it 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 since the Revolutionary War. Uh, we have allowed for doctors to set their own fees. And I think the lobbying of, of doctors groups has reinforced that time and again in the, early, in the 1900s when healthcare was starting to become much more expensive. Hospitals were starting to be utilized because science was coming into the, the like, in, in, with gains in science, they had to be centralized in hospitals because of the machinery utilized. And so what you, People used to get healthcare in their homes, but now they had to come to the hospital. And as it was becoming more expensive, it was clear that people couldn't afford these things. And so, you know, European countries were thinking about like how to provide it for 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 um, populations. And that was there was a thought about that in America, but but lobbies really like put that to bed. You know, we're not going to doctors are not yielding authority. They're not yielding the 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 ability to to. Uh, uh, bill patients. And so that also kind of like, you know, snowballed into the Great Depression, where, you know, there was just more of an inclination for other social reforms rather than to take on health care. And then in, the, in 1945, during World War II, in order to avoid inflation, we decided to peg our health care with uh, employment. And that was because really it was really because the government didn't want to it, it worsen inflation and so they didn't want corporations to offer uh, you know employees higher wages as a as a, as an enticement to come to their uh, into into their companies and so they allowed them to offer them health insurance benefits and that's how it became to the point where health insurance became a part of working and it, and it and it also you know came with this american ideal which is like you work for your health care which we talk about in the you know that came from the charity uh, the charity movements and everything scientific charity movement you have great um among many, many other things great chapter headings uh this chapter 11 is uh titled algorithmania algorithmania yeah here we have this um i don't know if you can see it chart yeah so- can you talk about that? Yeah, that, that's a great, that's a, that, thank you for that question, actually. Um, that was really on my mind working, because when you're a doctor, you feel like 
that sometimes you feel like you're not doing your job unless you fulfill the algorithm, like the decision tree. And so that is an algorithm for how to deal with chest pain. And what I found over time is, is that what's happened in healthcare is, is that, and, it, and, it, and it's gone along with the way that things are incentivized, but doctors can feel they're doing a good job if they just get down that tree, you know? And it's like, and it's, so what that ends up becoming is a person comes in with chest pain. What I really want to do is rule out a heart attack but you're not really addressing the central question of like, why is this, what, what, what is the, what is causing the chest pain? Right. So algorithmania to me is it's a, it's a term that I invented, but it's like, in my mind, it's like, it's like an unthoughtful ad adherence to that, that prevents you from listening and trying to solve a problem that a patient has. Right. And so uh, what is the antidote to algorithmia? How do the, an the antidote is a mixture of listening, attentiveness, bravery too, and also just you know just giving advice and trying to solve a problem. However, you know you know. So some of it does involve the. So I you know I, I put that in the book. I'm not saying we should just toss away our like algorithm. You know that they're tools, but they're one tool in that you utilize in sitting at the bedside and thinking about a person's problem and then contextualizing for that person that problem so that they understand what's going on so that we can take a step forward because if you just rule out heart attack that person doesn't know why that that that, that pain has returned they will come back to the emergency room that you know what i mean so it's like we're trying to be i think like you know, uh, the antidote to that is listening and communication. Right. Spending time. Spending time. Yeah. And I it mean, doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be spending time doesn't have to be. I, what I found is that my patients don't want me to be like holding their hand for 30 minutes. What they want is just attentiveness. And like, you know, you can you can have a very good conversation where everybody's in line and, and it, it doesn't have to take that long. You know, it's about honing those skills for communication so that you're attentive to what, you know, you're absorbing what they want, you hear what they want, and you can communicate that back to them. And you feel like you're on the same, you're, you're trusting each other so that you can take a step forward in the, in, in, you know, in the clinical. One of the, one of the things that's so clear about you, Ricardo, is that you, <clears throat> you know, you're very knowledgeable, obviously, you know, expert doctor, hospitalist, as you explained earlier, and at the same time, you bring humility to every conversation. You um, are disarming. Um, I'm curious uh, just about what story of the many stories you told here threw you for sort of like threw you for a loop. It, was, there a, was there a case where you just felt like you just didn't know what to do? And can you talk about sort of the process as a doctor of trying to puzzle through that of trying to figure out how yeah well I mean I will say this like it, it didn't happen I didn't write about it in the book but when you say it, it still weighs on me I mean there was a it was during uh well let me put it like this it was during the lockdown phase of COVID where people weren't allowed to have family members come into the hospital and one of my patients was elderly and she had a she had chest pain and shortness of breath, and we found that it was because of one of her valves that is was not functioning properly. Now, this type of ailment is one of the things that you learn in medical school. One of the first things you learn is that there's a graph, and it it's like literally mortality falls like right when people start to have these symptoms. It means their mortality within the next year is extremely high. You know. And so the only way to, to solve this problem is surgery, you know, or a heart, a valve replacement. And the, uh, I, I, I talked with the woman about it and she, you know, I was able to speak with her in Spanish, her, her fan, she was from, uh, she was from a Central American country. And so my, my, uh, you know, my heritage, my family's from Central America. So I feel like we could have a rapport there, but it was a very difficult question whether or not she wanted an open heart surgery for this valve replacement at her age. 
And she was very scared and she did not want it. And there was a time where she was just like, I really just don't want it. But she didn't have her family there. And, you know, when I talked to her family about it, they were like, "Where?" you know, they, she could only talk with them on FaceTime and, and they, you know, and they were like, well, we'll talk to her. And I could tell that, you know, they not being in the room with us, they couldn't feel her fear the way that I felt it, you know? And so she did like, you know, I think that they convinced her to go through with the surgery. And I mean, she went, I think, in part to placate her family. And she, 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 she went into surgery and she didn't do well. She did not do well. She, she died after the surgery. And I think that it was one of those situations that still lingers in my mind about how you know, I could feel her fear and I just didn't communicate it probably enough to her family. I knew that I, I was trying, you know, I was trying to be like the, this is, you could flip a coin either way. There's, there's 80, there's whatever age people who are more like 50 year olds, right. Who can handle a surgery like that. And then there's the, ultra, the but, but the, it really matters the belief that you have going into this, I feel like. And that's one of those mysterious parts. That's something that we talked about on Fresh Air also. It's like the uh, the mysterious parts of, of medicine, you know, where it's just like, it's not, um, you know, I, I, can't, I can't put numbers on all this, you know, but I can tell you that it doesn't feel like uh, a patient who is not believing in what's going to happen. It, it's usually not a good omen, you know, so. Right. Well, let's talk about solutions. Yeah. I'm still going to invite people to ask questions in our, you know, last uh, remaining uh, few minutes. Um, how, what's the answer? <laughs> the question that I, as a journalist, always dread, but you as a practitioner and as a writer could potentially answer more forcefully. And you do, in fact, in your book, can you summarize what your vision is for the way forward for yeah. the rest of America? I think we need to have universal basic healthcare access. Okay, I think that that's uh, that will allow us all to know that th that will actually help us all to afford healthcare more. I know that that doesn't sound like it. Uh, it, it might sound counterintuitive, but the way that healthcare is organized right now is is that we are all fending for ourselves we're all a little you know we are all trying to get insurances maybe maybe we're in a little group with it's through our employer or everything but there's strength in numbers when you're purchasing this you know and i think that universal basic healthcare access is number one because it creates an enormous group which can um mitigate the risk for everybody and and allow that everybody has um, access and drive down prices. Now, I think that how you do that is going to be, you know, there, there's on one hand, you could do something like Medicare for all, which is what uh, Senator Sanders, Senator Bernie Sanders proposes. And that that has some real force, but I also think it has some some drawbacks. I think that a system like that, Americans would have to do away with their private insurance under the current uh, um, the way it's being drafted is 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 that there would be only be one insurance for everybody and you would have to give away your private insurance i think that the health care that i'm th that i've experienced here in houston is is that we have a system that's available for everybody and that we provide for those who cannot afford it we provide a basic standard amount it includes you know, primary care, preventive care, but also like care for like um, chemotherapies, you know, pretty, pretty good care for a, a many, many uh, medical things. But that does not, that does, that is not mutually exclusive from private insurance. People would be able to purchase their own private insurance if they want. So basically we would have a system that everybody could utilize you know, but if you want to buy private insurance to have more bells and whistles or to have real other advanced care that the basic doesn't cover, then you purchase it, you know, and I think the reason that's important is because imagine you're a 23 year old coming out of college or even if you're not on out of college right now, you have to purchase health insurance and it's expensive, you know, and you either give some of your paycheck toward it or whatever. 
What if you didn't have to do that? What if you could rely on the healthcare system? The insurance companies would say, hey, you maybe maybe you do want to come to us and we're going to lower our price for you. You know, we're going to you would make it you would make them have to compete more for your money. You know, you would have to make them prove to you. You know, I think that buying health insurance is valuable if we had a basic system for everybody. And that's the way I think that we're going to get out of this stranglehold that we are experiencing of private corporations really just like every year healthcare premiums are going up healthcare costs are going up and it's because it benefits people it benefits the, uh, those you know we have to think about as a public competing with them you know okay another question from Garrett if you could put this book into the hands of one person or a group of people in healthcare who would it be my dad. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> because he 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 read it actually. Uh, but anyway. Why did you say that? No. No, because because my dad, just because like it, it's it's been one of those things where you know where I was not sure if my dad was going to read the book, but he read it in two days and he liked it, so I was very happy. Because he's a he's in this book and he's like I, I wasn't sure if he was going to avoid, it. but no, I that was just a joke. Um, if I could put it into the hands of of one person. I mean, I would have I would have to say President Biden right now. I mean, I think that uh, I think President Biden would engage with it. I really I don't know. I mean, it's 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 maybe I'm being I, I know I know that I'm like purely being like naive about it, but no, you're not. It, this is not, not well. This is not because I didn't write this. I didn't write this book to preach to the choir. This is not a book where I was like. This is not a book that's that that again. I started off with patient stories, and then I built the ideas. Then I then I then I then I extracted the ideas, you know, from it. It wasn't like starting off with the ideas and then finding stories. It was, it was, and I think that I try to reckon in this book with like the problems that this has, and so I think it appeal. It's trying to make a conversation between moderates and it, it, between both parties you know it's trying to make a moderate conversation about healthcare while taking a step forward you know so i see it as like taking principles from the right and the left you know and and maybe that's one of the reasons why it had to happen in houston texas because houston is like a a, a blue dot in a, in a red state it's a very interesting place you know but um i think on one hand one 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 side really wants healthcare costs addressed. And I really understand that and feel that. And then the other side, you know, people want universal healthcare access for everybody, you know, and I understand that too. And I feel like, wow, this is a system that can accomplish both. So that's why I would just be like, I would shoot for the absolute top. And I would say like, Mr. President, please read my book. <laughs> <laughs> shoot for the top. I know, Mr. I know. President, please read this book. Read this book. Speaking of reading, we have five minutes left. Is there another passage that you would like to share? Your, your writing is so glorious, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you did, this would be a good moment. Otherwise, we can keep talking. Let me see. I can um, yeah, I can start. I'll read, I'll read just uh, briefly from like the uh, from the very from the second chapter, the dead parts, uh, introduction to one of the subjects, Stephen. If Stephen Hart was good at one thing. It was managing restaurants. For 12 years, he'd resurrected different branches of a burger chain in Houston and made them profitable. Stephen didn't have an MBA or any kind of special training. He had people skills, which, after some twists and turns in life, had bloomed for him in the service industry. The truth was that Stephen enjoyed going out of his way to help customers. He loved becoming the highlight of someone's day. That corporate talk about turning an ow into a wow sounded lame, yes, but in fact, it made him tick. He wasn't one of those general managers who buried himself in an office tracking avocado prices during the dinner rush. Rather, he preferred striking up conversations and with customers the moment they stepped through the door. One night, while Stephen was taking orders at the counter, a guest mused to him about having eaten the tastiest burger there the last time he came, one with slabs of bacon and Swiss cheese, topped with a thick slice of grilled pineapple. Did Stephen know the burger? That would be the Hawaiian burger, Stephen said, smoothing out the ends of his stash. His silvery voice and appearance, Kempt, 
like a man rising from a barber's chair, helped to soften the bad news that the chain hadn't carried the burger for years. Man, the guest lamented. Most general managers would have chalked up the disappointment to part of the job. Specialty burgers came and they went. Stephen, however, was not most managers. Would you like one, he asked. That would be awesome. Stephen warned him it might take a minute, since he knew this kitchen didn't stock pineapple. He picked up the keys to his truck, exited the restaurant, and drove three miles to the nearest grocery store where, for 89 cents, he purchased the can of the prized fruit. Not 10 minutes later, the first dribbles of nectar sizzled on the grill. Stephen made sure the char was just right before flipping the pineapple over and then crowning his concoction. As the guest bit into his Hawaiian burger, Stephen knew he'd earned a customer for life. So that's the beginning of that. But what's um, so what, great? What happens just, is, is I that you keep reading, but I know we only have two minutes left. But tell us, tell us what you're going to say. He, 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 he's dedicated to customers. He loves helping people. And then he finds himself in healthcare with a diagnosis where somebody tells him uh, he gives them, they give him the cancer diagnosis and they say, however, however, we can't treat you because you have bad insurance. And so that that is a punch in the gut for somebody who cares very deeply about helping about being that person who does the extra mile. Our healthcare system almost makes it like we can just bat an eye about that. However, yeah, you don't have insurance. So sorry, out the door, you know, but it's like, that's Steve, when Steven realizes that it, it's a real punch in the gut. So. Just stunning. So beautiful. Um, any final uh, thoughts that you want us all to hold about your book? Um, no, just, well, yeah, just that. Um, this, this is a problem that I think we need to solve democratically. This is something where we need to be informed about what health what healthcare is right now, who controls it, and what can we do in order to make things better is by voting for candidates who think about universal healthcare access for all, for the right reasons, who are committed to bringing down prices so that we can get that we can have universal health care for everybody. And I think you, we need to be informed. We need to vote accordingly. Ricardo, thank you so much. Everybody read this book. Thank you very much, Andrea. This was wonderful. I appreciate it. Always great to talk with you. Likewise. Thank you both so much. This was an incredible conversation. And truly, I just want to echo, although Andrea said it all, um, what a fantastic writer you are, Ricardo. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll say Greenlight really does have a literary reputation and finding nonfiction audiences who can access uh, that work across the mediums of fiction, nonfiction. Um, just hearing you read, it, it's really beautiful writing. So thank you. Thank you so much. That means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and thank you all so much. I see you in the chat. Thank you for your questions. And please do support Greenlight Bookstore and purchase Ricardo's book by the People's Hospital Hope and Peril in American Medicine from Greenlight. Thank you all and have a great night. Thanks thank everybody. you.